If there is a seat available at a table, if you could grab that. I think we're getting another table at the back here. If you still need a chair, there'll be one at the back. But um, if you could grab a seat, we'll, we'll get started. Well, let me, let me take this opportunity as we just get started here to welcome you tonight to Crossroads Church. Uh, I know we've come from different places and it's a privilege to be able to host this event tonight. And I know that we've all come with um, anticipation, with a sense that God is doing something. And so I, I, I'm anticipating a great evening together as we learn, talk, fellowship, and uh, try and get a little bit more of God's heart for mission. Tonight... Um, there are washrooms. If you're not familiar with the building, if you go out this door down to the right, there's washrooms down there. Um, feel free to have coffee and refreshments. Uh, my job is to welcome you here. I'd like to open up in prayer. I, I was just going to sit in the back tonight. I didn't even think I could come. And if I'd known I was introducing the president, I would have worn better clothes, Kervin. So um, this is once, just you get three times. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. So why don't we take a moment and just pray and ask the Lord to be present with us and, and that not only present, but that we would discern um, his voice and his spirit moving amongst us. Father, tonight we, we just thank you for your amazing grace. Each one of us are here because you um, went out on mission. You sent your son and your son sent your spirit and your spirit found us and drew us to Christ. And Father, we'll be forever grateful for that. And tonight as we discuss the, the work of your church and especially the missions, aspect of it. Father, we pray that we might be sensitive to the movement of your spirit. We pray that we would keep in step with him as he leads us and guides us. We pray for all the people speaking and presenting that you would fill them with your spirit. We pray tonight we'd be able to come out of this place with that sense in our hearts that it seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us. And so, Father, we just welcome your presence here in Jesus' name. Amen. Kervin, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Pastor Dan. <clears throat> Thanks for opening your church up to this uh, important gathering tonight. And it's my privilege to be here and to be among you and saying hello to lots of people I know and meeting, meeting new folks. And I've appreciated very much the, the leadership that Joel Zanting has been giving uh, to the Evangelical Missionary Church of Canada World Partners Movement. And you're going to hear Joel and his team talk uh, a, a, a lot about what they're sensing from people like you as they've given thought to not only where we are today, but where does Jesus need us to go? And I say that intentionally, where does Jesus need us to go? Because uh, when, we, when, when we think about it, and we don't have to think very long, but there's people all around us that need to find Jesus and need to learn how to walk in the ways of Jesus. And that's why we're here tonight. So I say hi to all of, all of you in the room that are leading a church in terms of a pastoral role. Some of you I'm, uh, are, are former missionaries. I mean career missionaries. And then all of us are on mission for Christ. That's what we need to be about. So um, that's all I want to say is just, uh, just glad you're here. And then I had prepared a video that uh, was shown in the places Joel and his team have been. So you're going to watch that now. And then Joel, I think you should come up and take over after because our brother Dan prayed already his blessing over this place. So let's let it roll. The mission of God is everywhere, all the time. When Jesus came into this world, he was determined. Ready? The mission of God is everywhere, all the time. When Jesus came into this world, he was determined to live out the mission that God had given to him. And it seems to me that if Jesus lived his life on mission for God, that we should be doing the same. We're on a quest as the Evangelical Missionary Church of Canada to follow in the ways of Jesus. This is why global missions matters to us so much. The question that we're asking of ourselves is, what would it look like for world partners to follow in the way of Jesus? This past six months or so, Joel Zanting and his team have been giving serious thought to what it means for us to follow in the ways of Jesus 
as it relates to living out the mission of Jesus locally, nationally, and internationally. I want to say thank you to all of the missionaries and pastors and lay people who have left us a legacy to follow and who are leaving us a legacy to follow. We're doing our best to follow in the put footprints that you've given for us. I want to say thank you to all of you that are watching this video. Your time and presence in participating in the Day With experience, a mission and culture tour across Canada, thank you for that. Thank you for giving your input into how we're going to figure out what it means for us to say yes to God as it relates to the future world partners. Thank you and God bless you. It's good to have you here tonight. Thank you for your presence. It means a lot to our team and uh, we welcome those who are, are coming, joining us through our live stream as well tonight, uh, wherever they are across uh, Canada and perhaps around the world. But we're thankful for uh, a chance to finish our tour here and, uh, and to have you uh, participating with us. And uh, as we go through tonight, uh, we'll introduce uh, various members of the team. But uh, my name's Joel, and it's been a real privilege uh, to step into the role of giving leadership to our global mission arm of our denomination. And, uh, and so when I think about that, I think back to uh, an appointment as an interim director uh, in the summer of 2017 that launched at about the same time that President Kirvin had started his time as our president, uh, a period of assessment. And we began uh, gathering input from our churches. Uh, and through late 2017 and into 2018, uh, we began to put together a picture of how our churches were thinking about global mission and uh, what was happening. It was very diverse, uh, what was happening. And as we presented those findings at our regional conference, our regional gatherings last spring, which were held in Ontario and here uh, at Crossroads Church in Alberta, uh, we received a very clear signal from uh, you, our people, that it was time for a reset on our global mission. And that never comes at, at a point of saying, we've been doing it all wrong. That's not what times of, of reset or rethink are about. Um, but it gave us an opportunity since last spring uh, to assemble a, a global mission task force, and that's representation from across generations, across churches, across church sizes, the different points of, of connection to God's mission around the world. And, uh, and so I'm just going to invite those who are on the global mission task force who are in the room to stand and uh, that's you, David Benjamin. I don't know if there's anybody else here tonight who participated, but I'd like uh, to just express thanks again for the work of the task force. Those of you who have led visionary processes, um, on a national scale like this, it's very unique and peculiar. And it seemed that the conversations this year to listen to our, our global workers, our missionaries who are working in different parts of the world, to listen to our churches, uh, to listen to what God was doing by His Spirit, um, to hear from our, our global church partners around the world, and to, to see that conversation widen and widen and widen. And some of you are familiar with the language of divergence and convergence. And so by December, our brains and minds and hearts were like overwhelmed with all of this input and giving that uh, back to the Lord in prayer and trusting him for the beginning of convergence. And what you have distilled in front of you tonight in document form, uh, there are three documents. And this is realistically tonight, we want you to think of these as a skeleton, as a bit of the foundation to build upon. It is not the final vision. And I think it's really important in times like this to understand that um, what, what it is we're really looking at and considering. Because we wanted to leave room for God's spirit through the church to speak into this process. And that's what we've been experiencing this last month uh, going across the country. And seeing not only region by region, 
but seeing as, as God's Spirit is adding affirmation to things, bringing very specific points of challenge, um, and that are, that are producing some follow-up uh, roundtable discussions. And so we want you to feel like you're a part of this process tonight, and it's not all resting on tonight. So let me tell you what, what's before you on the table. Um, there are three documents, and the one is called uh, Global Mission Terms. And if you're live streaming, you can go to emcc.ca slash daywith, and you can download these three resources from that page. And some of you have read them in advance, and thank you for that. But the global mission terms, sometimes like when you, when you have a medical appointment uh, with a specialist, and the specialist begins to talk in a language, and you're like, I have no idea what's going on in my body right now. And when we come to a, a conversation, we might not know all the words. And this is a starting point of some of the terms that are, are used in the global mission world. And some of them were new to me. And so if you felt a little lost in, in reading some of this, you're not alone. But we wanted to explain some, some of that and leave room in that document for other things you might hear tonight or read that need more clarity, because we really desire to be able to craft things in a language that pulls us together and unites us. And that's going to take uh, considerable effort. So you have that document as a backdrop tonight. We're not going to work through it. Um, there are two other documents that are before you, and we're going to actually spend some time tonight referencing those specifically and working through them. And so I, I want you to feel uh, a sense of ease as we have this conversation tonight to just make marks as we go along, to make notes as we go along. There will be time for Q&A. There will be time for interaction uh, at your table groups. And for those who are on the live stream, you will just simply use the, the YouTube video page in the comments section to put comments and questions that will filter back into our conversation tonight. And then you have cue cards on the table when you move into table groups. We just ask that you invite one person to write down what's being said at the table. So we can take that record with us and that helps us to include all of these pieces as we're praying and discerning working with our Global Mission Task Force, leading up to our, our General Assembly, which is the end of April. And so this is a, uh, a big task ahead of us, leading to the, uh, the weekend of our, our national conference, our General Assembly in Toronto at the end of April, where we will present uh, a vision that for the next few years is going to take time uh, to put together. There will be time for our assembly to ratify that, to say we agree with the spirit, as Dan has opened in prayer tonight, that it, it seems right to the spirit and to us uh, to move in this direction. And so we are grateful. Thank you for being here. And uh, as we begin tonight, um, it is with a, a deep sense of gratitude. This past month, our, our team has just enjoyed getting to know the the diversity of our churches across the country and even in the room here we're not one size fits all but we have a common heart and a common trajectory and uh, in our name in terms of being committed to the evangel the good news of that Jesus came to bring and make possible and to be missionary to be those who are sent out uh, lives and breathes in our denominational family and what a joy that is so I have some opening thoughts, and um, I want to center in on this, uh, this thought tonight. How many of you remember using one of these in elementary geometry school class? And it's called a compass. And uh, sometimes we forget and call it a protractor. That's OK. Partial marks for showing up to class. And the beautiful thing about a compass is that it has a pinpoint that gives you a, a starting point on a map or on a piece of paper. And from there, you can actually execute a very definitive radius out from the center and make a trajectory, a marking that is equal radius from that center point. And that's a, a good pivot. That's a very good way to think about times of shift or change or nuanced uh, course correction. And that's the kind of pivot that I believe the Lord is inviting us into. 
There are other kinds of pivots. How many of you are following March Madness? Any basketball fans out there? I see those three and a half hands. Um, and, and, and so in basketball, if you pivot too quickly, you can do a tremendous amount of damage to your knees. And I play another sport called squash. Any squash players out there? Oh, I see that one hand. That's about, that's about how it goes. And in squash, if you pivot too quickly, you can really damage your ankles. And there's a lesson there that if we, if we don't pivot uh, properly, we can actually do damage to the body. And so in times of vision renewal and rethinking, it is important for us to maintain that the center has not changed, that Jesus is Lord, that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, that salvation is through Jesus alone. And it is such a gift to have that, but that also from beginning and end of Scripture, that God has been relentlessly pursuing us, humanity, to be restored in relationship to him through Jesus Christ, culminating with this beautiful picture of one community eternally with God from every tribe, language, nation, and tongue. And we are here, not just to live in this world that we see, but to participate in God's kingdom work, and that is such a joy. And so our journey is one that flows on that, uh, that same trajectory that God has had us on, and our center remains solid. When we think about this analogy of pivot, I want to cover a couple of things as a backdrop. First is the surface. What is the lay of the land? What have we been learning about what's going on in the world and in the church around the world that informs how we participate in God's mission? And secondly, uh, what, in fact, is the marking that we've experienced as the Evangelical Missionary Church? What is that trajectory or that marking that God has been writing our story to include? And, uh, and so we want to do those before we talk about what we envision as the change ahead. And, uh, and so the surface, just a couple thoughts here in terms of, uh, of some things that are happening in our world today that you may be aware of or they may be new. One of them is the gravitational pull globally towards cities. And we're experiencing this in our own country that that majority of Canada is living in cities. And around the world, we're seeing this massive explosion happen in cities all across the globe. And what is that doing then to the, the nature of vulnerability of people, of the divide between rich and poor, of uh, the lack of, of access to clean water and enough food supply? There are huge issues that are facing global cities. What does that mean for us as followers of Jesus called to live and proclaim his good news on this planet? Another one is perhaps touched your life and your community, and that is major migration routes. And you can see these uh, are statistically here from The Economist, but some of the world's most important current routes. And that includes the recent years of people fleeing uh, countries of turmoil around the Middle East and trying to find their way into Europe. And in fact, uh, maybe you recall that some countries uh, thought of putting up a, a wall or a fence we might say, to just keep out uh, the, those people that they, they say, we've had enough, we don't want any more uh, people coming across seeking refuge in our country. Massive issues. But it happens that migration affects the nature and dynamic of all of our communities. In fact, we see that, that God has been reshaping the globe and that migration uh, affects very deep connections so that Communities we would call diaspora communities, dispersed peoples, have not only a strong linkage to one another within a given place, but have this invisible underground network where they will do whatever it takes to be a blessing to their people wherever they are scattered around the world. Are we blessing them? Are we praying for them? Are we supporting them? Are we looking for ways in which we can join God in his mission as it affects uh, the different demographics that we see? Thirdly, many of us are familiar with the exploitation of human beings. In fact, we often center this in simply on sex trafficking 
And there are many stats here that, that show country of origin for human trafficking, uh, where people are originally lured from, but we know that the exploitation of human beings is a chain that actually goes all around the world. And it breaks the heart of God in every situation and every instance. And we also know that there are other forms of, of exploitation of people that are ongoing in the world today. That people are, are living uh, with an injustice as indentured servants, modern day slaves, some who just simply have their land stolen from them and are completely displaced. And this breaks the heart of God and how are we now called to live on this planet? There are many more global trends and uh, that's just a few of them. But think about what's happening in the church. Right now, uh, the, the word on the screen here is, there's a strong global South church. And when we think about the majority of followers of Jesus who are alive on the planet right now, they are in Southeast Asia, in Africa, and in South and Central America. The global South church is the strongest part of the church on the planet. What does that do to our sense of engagement? So should we just simply sit back and say, well, we had a good run? Do we abdicate a role? Or what does it look like to honor that and to, to really embrace how God's church is rising in the global south? Not just to output, but to learn from, to receive. And second, the mission is no longer from the west to the rest, and that's familiar to many of us but that that would filter how we think about mission engagement, that if mission is from everywhere to everyone, then what does that do to our structures of thinking of ourselves as mission-sending organization? Uh, would we rather say sending and receiving organizations? What would that look like to embrace those whom God is calling in Korea to come and serve in Canada, would we embrace them with as much enthusiasm as sending our people to Tanzania? That's a bit of the lay of the land that gives a sense of, of the scope of things we've been working through as a global mission task force and praying uh, through. Secondly, what is this marking, this journey that we have been on as the Evangelical Missionary Church of Canada? We've already celebrated uh, those who've gone before us tonight and I would say that uh, in these two ways, I'd like to pick up on how uh, the EMCC has had a beautiful trajectory. It's not perfect, thankfully. We still need Jesus. But the gift of having a strong heart to live for Jesus in, in both of our streams historically, the evangelical church and the missionary church put together there has been a hunger and a yearning of our people to live fully for the Lord Jesus Christ. Where we are, to live a life of witness and to extend that throughout the world. And it is a beautiful heritage. And so you have may, maybe heard that filtered into our vision as a national church, that Jesus' mission would be our mission, or that we are following Jesus together on mission in the world. And this is a way for us to stay centered on the Great Commission. That is, we are called to make disciples who make disciples. And that is the, the lifeblood of us as a denomination, a trajectory that pulls us together despite our diversity across the country. And what a gift it is to have that in the scriptures. This familiar passage, when we think about the, uh, the Great Commission texts, uh, that are with us in the Gospels and the early part of, of the book of Acts, center in on this one. The command here is one command. It is make disciples. It is a rare command that Jesus says go. It is a common command to say as you are going, as you are living. And in this Matthew uh, section, the, the verb is make disciples. That is the centerpiece of this. Make disciples, and as you are making disciples, see them baptized in union with the Trinity and with God's people, the church. As you are making disciples, 
Teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. Do you see the discipling nature of that teaching? It isn't just preaching and teaching from the professionals who are gifted and called to do that. It is that mentorship, that discipling, that journey with others to teach others to obey what God has given to us and commanded for us to walk out. And always to remember that Jesus is with us in every situation, season of life, and circumstance. What a joy to have that sense. And add to that, in Luke chapter 10, Jesus is the one who does give the command to go. In this passage, Jesus is sending out the 72, two by two, ahead of him to every town and place that he was about to go. And he gives them some really important uh, structure to that. He invites them first to pray. To pray and understand that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, I want all of you to be praying that God would would mobilize people to respond to the needs in the world for those who have not encountered Jesus and his kingdom. And he, he says, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers. And then he says, go. I'm sending you out. Now, this going is in a posture that is peculiar. It's not filled with a knapsack full of things to give. It is a contrite heart. It is a self-emptying life. It is going out as a lamb among wolves. That humility, let that rest with us tonight. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals. Do not greet anyone on the road. That is the nature of the going. When you enter a house, first speak peace to this house. Do not assume that you are trustworthy in the lives of other people and other cultures. We must take time to be peacemakers in the name of Jesus, to earn the right to walk the road with people in their lives. We have to honor the ways in which God's Spirit invites us to go in this posture of humility. And if someone of peace is there, Your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Don't expect that every encounter with others will be this Disney film. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what's offered to you. Do you hear what Jesus is saying? I want you to go and be a guest. Think about your posture as a guest. When you are someone's guest, how much you honor the, the cues you get from your hosts. This is the spirit or nature in which Jesus clearly sends us this command, go. And it is with this posture of humility to go as a guest. And in that vein, to heal the sick who are there. To proclaim the nearness of the kingdom of God. And the passage goes on when you're enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, the dust of your town we wipe off from our feet, but be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near you. And it isn't always that we have to walk away and say, oh my goodness, I, man, I didn't get as far down the road as I want to. But there's a kicking off of this dust, which is to say, Lord, I have to leave the results with you. There's something very beautiful about that and and very important for us. And so in these ways, we are inviting us to return to this sense of of disciple-making focus in a posture of humility. The other is integral mission or holistic gospel. And these are words that somehow in the evangelical world, we know that the 20th century, we bantered them around a bit and maybe even uh, divided the sense of evangelism with doing good or service. But you know, our roots are all intertwined with this sense of holistic gospel or integral mission. And we're naming it so that it might come alive in all of our people, just like it's alive in our churches. We don't just preach about Jesus. We heal the sick. We take care of the needs of the, of the poor. We are those who are mobilized to respond in the mission of God. And so it is with integral mission. Now, pictured here is Janet Douglas. And I thought of of an illustration that would take us back to the 1800s. Janet lived in the 1860s. And 19 years of age, 
she was converted and gave her life to Jesus Christ to live for him. And by age 21, you know what she was doing? That's right, she was. She was out there leading prayer meetings, and she was leading evangelistic services, and she would take supplies with her and feed the poor and care for those that she met. In fact, in Ontario and into Michigan, she just worked and traveled village by village. South of Owen Sound, Ontario, there were a couple preaching points. Do you know the denomination, the association didn't know what to do with her because women couldn't be pastors back then. So they were like, what do we, what do we call her? And they, they coined this. She was the first ministering sister. And, and so we see that, that later she had this recognition. Jesus didn't just command us to go and proclaim him as Savior and Lord. He came to model a lived gospel that had social transformation, economic transformation, cultural transformation to individuals, and God loves nations. And so all of this integral mission that you're going to hear about tonight is a, a reintegrating things on purpose because it's alive in our next generations and it's awakening us again to the beautiful way in which God uses all of us and mobilizes all of us to his mission. So that's a little bit about the marking or the journey that we're on. I'm going to invite Nicole to come up and talk about the, uh, the document, the, the Theology of Integral Mission. And so if you want to pull that out, um, at the bottom of page one, there are, there's the start of some basic affirmations. And what we are saying is that in this trajectory, uh, we desire to have a foundation for mission and values for mission that will continue this story. Hi, everybody, and those of you joining on the live stream. Um, we wanted to bring your attention to this theology of integral mission, partly because of what we have on page one of the proposed vision where we talk about EMCC World Partners becoming a resourcing body for our churches, for our deployed international workers, our World Partners missionaries or recognized missionaries, and our global partners. And we're seeing this document as part of that process, an opportunity to reflect deeply and think deeply about what it might mean for us to participate with God's mandate to live our lives in the spirit of Jesus and also proclaim who he is. And so, Within this document, we have three basic affirmations. The first of which is that the mission is God's. God is the one with the missional heart. His entire heart is for the restoration of all peoples, of all things back to himself, societies and culture and creation to be restored. And so if that is true, if the mission is God's and God is the one who ultimately has a missional heart, then the mission of God has a church. The church does not have a mission. The mission of God has a church, has followers of Jesus. That's on the top of page two, the, the middle of page two here. That third affirmation, that if the mission of God has the church, has followers of Jesus together to participate with him, that we as followers of Jesus and the church that is in Red Deer are the ones that you're a part of and represent, that you are sent into the world together with those brothers and sisters from the global south. And so what does that mean? If all of us as followers of Jesus around the world are sent into the world together, how now shall we live? How now shall we serve? And how now shall we pray? And out of those affirmations, uh, through the remainder of this document, there's some key considerations and some notes on towards best practice. Those statements are not meant to be directive. They're meant to be pieces of reflection, for contemplation, and for some spiritual discernment about what that might mean for you as an individual or for your church. And part of the reason we're bringing it to all of the places we've gone on this tour is for your input, for your contemplation, for your interaction with this document, as we see it as part of the resource we wanna provide our churches and to individuals who are discerning in the spirit of God what it might mean for them to participate. So again, we're not expecting that you'll just quickly read through that, but take it with you, and in light of what you're hearing tonight, to, to ask the spirit of God to, to give you insight and wisdom 
into a way to lay this, this theology of integral mission out before our whole church to inspire us to be people of prayer and participation in God's mission, every one of us. And that that would just fuel uh, as you, as churches continue that journey, uh, that would fuel all of us to be involved. I want to come back to the proposed vision and strategic direction document and, um, and say that our trajectory um, is talking about uh, staying in step with these themes that we've been discussing, being a disciple-making movement, a reintegration of integral mission, and that that's uh, coming alive in these values that we've seen, that we, we are those who are called to behave, which are our values, not uh, just aspirational values, what we hope to be one day, but how we are called to behave in the world, to live out the way of Jesus, all of us, by listening and trusting and obeying the Spirit of God and practicing that sacrificial love in our everyday life. And to foster this sense of mutuality around the world, there's the, the sense of the, the global south of, of yearning to have this sense of equity and partnership in the work of the Lord around the world. To collaborate with like-minded partners, to, uh, to stop any sense of maybe a two-tiered system of those that are working directly under our supervision uh, within the denomination or those sent out with other mission agencies, but to have global workers under one banner with our global partners and say, these are our workers around the world. Pray for them. Bless them. Invite them into your churches. Hear what God is doing. Partner together with what God is doing. And a big piece on engagement, engaging churches and individuals that, that keep disciple-making at focus as we are mobilizing God's people. We're going to explain more about that as we move to talking about engagement. And then finally tonight, to int introduce um, and, and to talk with cultural awareness and sensitivity, that we are those who get to learn the beauty of God's creative diversity on the planet by learning to love other cultures. Sometimes we think all other cultures are evil or all other cultures are fantastic and we should be more like them. But realistically, those, those aren't true. And that God's kingdom breaks forth in all kinds of unique ways around the world into every culture because they were made as a part of his tapestry, his beautiful picture of humanity that we will be together with forevermore. And so as we spend some time uh, moving forward tonight and talking about the pivot, the trajectory that we see. Um, we wanted to have a little bit of background for you tonight on the things that are foundational and the things that underpin what we're going to walk through next. And so um, we want to take some time to, to begin there. Um, and, uh, and just at, on page two, you'll see that we have some proposed mission statements and vision statements and the reason we've done it that way is um, because we're, we're still gaining input and refinement on ideas that resonate with us. And, uh, and so rather than just presenting, here it is, um, that we, we want the good pushback and the engagement around it. But we've been working with the, the last visionary statement on the bottom of the page there, uh, the sense of, of where we're going is that we engage people in global mission participation. That, that means you. Our, we, are, we are here to help engage with God's people, primarily those within the EMCC church family. But we know that some of you are in EMC congregations, and you have networks of discipling that go beyond. And, and so this isn't just about us, but you're the primary responsibility that we are seeking to serve. And, uh, and so it's this sense of participation through strategic global presence, integral development, and compassionate action that results in this beautiful work of transformation that God has done. And so seeing this go forward is a vision statement that's a bit generic. And maybe some of you are saying it's not holy enough. It doesn't hold uh, enough. Until you show up at the, uh, the doorstep of India and are rejected because you serve the Evangelical Missionary Church of Canada or many of the uh, nations that still lack a, an indigenous-led church 
are, are hard to access. And so we're trying to include a picture that will mobilize all of us to include unreached people groups in the world today. And so this, we'd like to walk through tonight. If you would turn to the next page, page three, and I'm grateful that those in the room mostly have this in color. If you have a black and white, you can just follow along with the, with the words. But what we'd like to do is take the first two because they tie deeply with what we've talked about. Then we're going to break and have you ha give some time in table groups to discuss what you've been hearing. And then we're going to move through the final three uh, aspects of this vision. And then we'll do some more Q&A together. So... Um, just to start off on page four, um, as, as we've been working this last year, we have enjoyed starting from this vantage point, not, hey, EMC churches, we're world partners, we're over here, we're doing X, Y, and Z, and you should come and do that with us. But this sense of, um, of understanding more deeply, tell us about what global mission engagement is looking like in your church community and among your people. And you know, we have our formal congregations and we also have lots of people connected to EMCC who are uh, in little house groups and so on. And the Lord knows all about that. We are all invited to participate in his global mission engagement. Whether they're formal churches, large churches, mid-sized churches, small churches, informal living room groups. If we are two or three gathered together in Jesus' name, that's awesome. How is God inviting us to participate in his mission. But you know, we have many churches, I'm just gonna address the bottom text there, partner, agency, and church together. And um, you know, I'm, I'm a cheesy leader. I thought, yeah, that's a cool acronym. We could call it PACT. And uh, the people around me said, Joel, go away. <laughs> and, um, and so we have many of our congregations that have church-to-church -church partnerships. And we're inspired by the good stuff of that, the building of relationships that happens, the ongoing sense of, of working with and developing uh, not only a partnership, but seeing God's work uh, come to fruition and grow within partners. But there's another dynamic that's also involved, and, and that is that uh, we could have a number of, of individual churches partnering within the same country, uh, with different churches who aren't talking to each other. And it seems that the closer uh, the, the world is to North America, to USA and Canada in particular, the more there's, there's an issue. In the country of Mexico, if you are a church who is banked or backed financially in a heavy way by a North American church, they have a name for you. And it's not very pretty. You're called gringuitas. What it's done is it's isolated one church that's benefiting from a lot of influx of partnership and is creating animosity with the body of Christ around. And so the Lord is asking us to just be wise about these, these other points of engagement. And so as we come alongside, we want to be a part of that, that strategic picture and we can see the vision that God gives to the leaders of the body of Christ, interdenominational, and within our own partnerships, yours and ours, to begin to collaborate together and seek the Lord's direction for how they can be more effective in making disciples and extending that to the nations of the world. And so being a part of those conversations allows us to partner more intelligently. And for our churches who are partnering with the same country, to network you together. And so not to control it, but to be, begin to be a hub within the network to create those spaces. Because many of your churches have said, we have a strong partnership here and we'd love to share that with others. And this is a way for that to be a blessing as well to others. And so we're gonna walk through the top two boxes on that same page on page four that talk about church engagement and on-ramp experiences. The first being church engagement. The idea here is being able to work with individuals and churches in pursuing how God is nudging them or you to participate. That church engagement starts with conversation. For us as world partners to ask questions about what God has been laying on your heart or how you've already been involved and how can we resource you in that? How can we come alongside and collaborate? And for us, that's, that's been really exciting and something that on this tour people have really resonated with. 
that we've had um, young couples come, come up to us in Calendar Bay who said, I'm really excited about what, what you guys shared. I think God is calling us to Siberia. And I was like, well, God must really be calling you because Siberia is quite desolate. <laughs> but that they felt encouraged. And so what does it mean for us to walk with them in spiritual discernment and conversation to connect them with those who are either doing a pioneering work in Serbia or the indigenous-led church that's there? And so that comes through engagement conversation. And the openness to that and to how God is nudging you and your churches to participate can lead to additional resourcing, can lead to courses like Kairos, which I know in Crossroads is quite familiar, but is an opportunity to understand the missional heart of God and what it means to strategically partner with him around the world and some of the unique opportunities that are coming to us as a result of where we are in the world today. And so how can we as world partners be in that process with you and be in those conversations and allow us to be for you and how God is calling you to participate? So whatever that might look like. And we look forward to being part of that process with you as you invite us in. In addition, out of those initial pieces of church engagement and resourcing, there may be those that are sensing God's nudging to participate in a vocational way or assessing a call that they feel to international cross-cultural ministry. And that leads us to sort of our second box there called the on-ramp. This idea of being able to have immersion learning experiences where people can go and sit at the feet of followers of Jesus in Tanzania and Ethiopia and learn from them and how God has been speaking to them in their context. And what does it mean for us to part to partner with those who might want to go on an immersion learning experience in Ethiopia or Tanzania. To be able to partner in the pre-departure process, bring some learning pieces to prepare our posture for being part of that immersion learning experience. Bringing some clarity and some clarifying questions as they're moving through that immersion learning experience however long. And finally, being part of the DB process for what God might have been saying to them in country and have had enough time to download it and process it for themselves. And that processing might be, I'm called to be in Red Deer. And that's great <laughs> because they've been able to discern that call. So again, it's being able to collaborate alongside those churches and use individuals that can affirm how God has been speaking in someone else. We've seen this opportunity, this discussion around on-ramp to be received well on the tour, particularly by some of our pastors who have said thank you because there, there are some people that say, God has called me and they're gone. And now what are you supposed to do? <laughs> so how can, we, how can we come alongside and be part of that process with you, collaborate with you, so that frankly things don't end up in a train wreck? for those that are going or for those partners that are receiving them? And how might we be part of that process? And that in fact those on-ramps aren't just necessarily for someone who's making a major decision in the career part of their life. Did you know that you can go into Malaysia under a retiree visa right now? That there are Rohingyan refugees leaving Bangladesh going to Malaysia to try to find work? And that there's desperate need to partner with what God is doing there? And that the e easiest way to get in is on a retiree visa? So it's for every age and stage in life. And that in fact is God is moving around the world and we've seen people migrate and we've seen the things that grieve God's heart, that there are unique opportunities he's opening. And so how do we respond in our resourcing to those unique opportunities? I'm getting excited. I don't know where the Lord's gonna take me in this, on this planet. Um, the gift of of this, this next page, number five, and talking about our disciple-making focus and some of the work we've already laid out with the theology of mission. I don't want to go over that again, but, but have it in view as we think about how this integrates with, uh, with, with church and mission being blurred. And, uh, and so we're living in a day and age when, uh, actually yesterday, John Pello from the Canadian Council of Christian Charities was representing the interest of churches with a Senate committee in Canada who are weighing the pros and cons of us having charitable status as religious organizations. And so there is a defense of uh, what's going to happen to the future of our status within our own country. To be a charity in Canada means we exist for the good of Canadian people. 
but we know that the good news of Jesus Christ and his kingdom work actually blesses communities. And if we are God's people who are engaged in his mission where we live and throughout the world, that is good news for Canada. And we should not be afraid of whatever our status might be tomorrow, whether it gets revoked or not. But I know that there will be a stronger chance if we are mission organizations and thought of in those terms, that there is a future for us to be seen as being for the good of the Canadian people. It should be that way for churches, but we know that we know that we're living in a different time. But friends, church and mission have always intended to be the same, that God's mission has a church. It's not that we're doing our own thing. It's that we are here to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, to live for him, to participate in his mission to all the nations. The last box on page five talks about creative prayer movements. We, we've had a chance to listen to how our churches uh, have great diversity in how we're praying for what's going on around the world. Um, praying through the news, praying through the needs of the world, praying, uh, uh, setting up a prayer room with a map and some cushions on the floor. All kinds of varieties of ways. And then there are all kinds of prayer movements that are going on. So what are we to do? Cherry pick one or two and say this is the way? No. How can we come alongside and participate with these organic prayer movements that are just springing up, that are hard to keep track of? Praise the Lord. That in fact, among second generation Canadians, children of immigrants, that this is particularly springing up. That there are Eritrean youth groups praying over the Toronto airport for those that are traveling to and from to any destination or for those that are coming to resettle in Canada. And so do, how do we encourage that and fan into flame? How do we encourage that next generation that are on their knees in prayer and worship for God to be known among all nations? And how do we continue to encourage that and fan that into flame? And that in fact, that's been a really exciting piece of what we've been observing in this present time but that in fact it has historical connections. That groups like the Moravians had a 24 hour a day, seven day a week prayer chain for 100 years. Bonkers. <laughs> that out of that prayer chain came three mission movements and two church renewals. And that in their scholarship and in their writings, the Moravians talk about mission movements being begun and sustained in movements of prayer. How now shall we pray? What does that mean for us? What does that mean for us in the posture of encouraging these prayer moves to, to continue? And how can we get on board? And how do we start that? How do we encourage the gift of intercession that is clearly present in our churches and amongst individuals to be able to pray for what God is doing around the world and to pray for him to come alive and fresh in new ways? We're gonna pause and give you a chance in your table groups just to discuss, and it'd be good if, if, again, somebody grabbed a cue card, and for those that are on the live stream, just for you to uh, put your comments uh, in the, uh, the dialogue there on the YouTube page. Um, this, this is a significant moment for us to listen to one another. What's God saying to you? As we've been talking about this foundation and, uh, and this idea of, of starting with the mobilization or engagement of everybody and this embeddedness of following Jesus together with the, the church around the world, what's God saying to you? And that we take some time, just get one person to annotate uh, that. And we're going to call you back in about uh, eight or ten minutes' time. I know some of the table groups are a little bigger, and so you'll have to manage the clock and watch that. But we want you to have some time to reflect together. So I encourage you to do that, and if you want to uh, get some more of the delicious refreshments provided, um, you could do that too. And, and feel free to write on, write on the documents as well if you want to, uh, to do that and send that to us as well along the way.
So, same thing with this. Can you reach it? Should we move the table back a bit? Okay. Um, do you want to walk around and do the mic and some of the transitional stuff? We're going to call you back, uh, so if we could have your, uh, your conversations wind up in the next little bit. And we'd, uh, we'd like everybody in the room to, uh, to say hello to the Sarnia uh, Evangelical Missionary Church. They have a group of 15 people, and Angela Metcalf from that congregation was on our Global Mission Task Force, and they're all tuned in together. So say, hi, Sarnia. Hi, Sarnia. And uh, that's great. Little shout out. All right, I'm going to come around with the mic, and we have a lot of groups here tonight. How come there are so many people here? But um, I wonder if, if your spokesperson could just be ready. We don't need everything, but we need a quick summary. And if you hear what other table groups have given as a summary, then don't repeat it, just skip over that. 
and we're just going to give a quick summation of what we're hearing in the room, and all of that input will come back to our team as well. So can we start here? Yeah. So we started talking for a long time, and then we realized that we might be getting to this later on in the last few pages, so maybe we're jumping ahead. But we wondered about the levels of support as you were talking about the uh, partner agency and church together. We're, we're realizing that there's um, independent churches that are, are doing their own thing and how, what are kind of levels of uh, engagement that we would have? Are, are we talking about world partners becoming a facilitator for that kind of thing? That's some of the question that we were having. And then the other question was um, you were talking about people that would go off and then on their own, how do we walk alongside them? That would be our question too, as far as what are the roles of the sending church and you know, world partners, other agencies, all of that. So that's what we're talking about. Uh, just, sorry, that was Colin. Oh, sorry. Please keep okay. your name. I'm Meredith. Um, we were quite excited and blown away by just the opportunity of ministering to immigrants who are coming to Canada. Um, and also just looking at the, the need for relationships and connection um, between us and others, just looking outside of our own little world and connecting globally with other churches. Um, and just what you guys were saying about the prayer movements and the power of that, but also our um, a recognition of our limitations in prayer here and what we have to learn from one another across the world of how to pray truly. I'm Travis, and uh, we talked a little bit about how um, the theology, theology of mission was built really well, and just even the simplicity of the phrase, God's mission has a church, speaks very loudly that God is already at work, Jesus is building his church, and we get to join in on that, and so we love that, how everything flowed from that, and just thought, you know what, like, that's amazing. So we just wrote this lens to following in on what the Lord is already doing. Um, discuss the vision statement. We're really happy about it. And um, last thing we said is we loved under the blue page about church engagement that uh, Jesus was really good at invitation and challenge when he was calling people and just love the high invitational language around um, church engagement. And then a question that didn't get to the paper, but I'm going to throw it out there, is when you talked about partner agency and church together, just one thought was would love to hear more about uh, the plan to develop best practices and what that looks like. Are we getting into that later? In fact, uh, Evangelical Fellowship of Canada already have a good best practice guide that you can download for church-to-church -church partnerships. Um, and so we're working with the EFC to adapt their material and to uh, pillage it. Our table had uh, a couple of things to celebrate and then one uh, concern. So just celebrating... Uh, the, the erasing of lines between denominations, erasing of lines between agencies, mission agencies, and a whole lot more uh, partnership that's going on. Uh, celebrating this, the idea of immersion learning, uh, getting uh, people into the place where they're going to be serving and learning alongside uh, probably seasoned veterans or mentors or, or disciples of some kind. Uh, the uh, the on-ramp was uh, celebrated as well, and, and that uh, you know, led to a concern, this, this idea of being proactive in helping people to be readied uh, for uh, serving Christ on a short-term basis or long-term. So now the concern was uh, that agencies, uh, mission agencies at times, appear to be uh, pro, uh, uh, proclaiming a now message, an urgency message, particularly to youth, and they're, they're wanting to go without really being readied to go, at least it appears that way. So I think there's a question uh, there, how do we help one another, how do we help churches to uh, develop uh, an on-ramp that, that helps youth to see that they need to be discipled and readied for the call? Excellent, back here please. Thanks. I'm Brian. So a, a celebration point, I think, is a, a prayerful discernment process to really look proactively into a ministry uh, that the church would partner with. 
and so it was stated, you know, we, we have to do this very prayerfully. And then it's not a short-term project. Like it's not, oh, let's get a bunch of projects and stuff like that, but actually it's a long-term uh, commitment to that. And also I would say, uh, from what I heard anyway, is using a variety of resources, even the government of Alberta. Can you believe it? The government of Alberta can have impact uh, overseas on, on a lot of things and translating some of that impact in, and being uh, used in, in, uh, in ways in another country that uh, they've been able to develop. So, so uh, probably another positive is just being available to hear the voice of God in this whole process and we're all involved in it. A challenge sometimes when you're using the other resources is that you don't always, uh, there's other people involved and they don't always come through, right? So uh, that, that sometimes is a challenge, okay? Thank you. Back here. Thank you, my name is Lucas. We were quite interested in the concepts of, of on-ramp coaching, already mentioned, and, and providing engagement conversations. And that's quite intensive stuff. And I thought, thank you for being ready to initiate that kind of thing. And I'm curious, we're curious to know, um, is this entirely new or has this been happening already? And then secondly, we were wondering, are you saying that you're encouraging direct linkage from our churches to partner churches um, in other parts of the world or, or our other country um, without the same weight of intermediary? That's a good question at the end there. That's not what I was saying, but um, <laughs> thanks for that. Can I come to this table? I'm Denise, and we agree with a lot of already what has been said. We really liked the focus on um, prayer and creatively thinking about that and what that can mean for churches. We talked about just the importance of realizing that we don't always have everything to offer everyone else, but uh, other cultures and nations can, as believers, can offer things to us. And then I really like this focus on this long-term discipleship, because I think we tend to separate evangelism and discipleship when really the command is to make disciples, which often is a long-term process, so. Thank you. My name is James. One of the things we talked about at our table was about, Anna mentioned that in the big, big picture, we uh, send people over the world, and maybe in the same area we have different agencies trying to do the same work, yet they're all going to the same mission school. You know, maybe we should look at working together, collaboration, and see if we can do more by working together instead of all trying to do our own stuff. And then we talked about discernment, clarifying what's next, and working with churches, how they can help us, or how we can help them, or how we can work together to glorify God. This table group here. Hi, I'm Nicole. Um, let's see, a few things that we came up with was, uh, actually, Dan did. <laughs> We're gonna put you on the spot. He said, how does our church vision align with the bigger vision that you guys are having? So for each of us, how that works, so we're not pouring out more on our congregants about where do we fit and how do we, in order for long-term discipleship to happen, there needs to be that wholeheartedness to it. Um, sharing with churches what we're already doing. So as a larger church, how can we partner with the smaller churches? Already not recreate the wheel, what's out there already? And uh, clarifying, nowhere in here we saw local. We saw lots of global missions. I'm not sure if that term was inclusive of local, but we thought if we actually identified that and pointed that out more clearly, we'd be good. Thank you. It's really great to hear uh, just summaries of these conversations, and I'm sure you've got more uh, thoughts that you can share with us as we go along. Um, would you permit us to walk through the last three of these, um, these boxes? Um, so I'm just going to invite you back to your vision document to page six and seven. And, uh, and so strategic global presence, why this, this uh, busy phrase? 
I think uh, we've had a history within the EMCC um, of thinking about uh, and, and being defined as world partners. We've been defined as a mission sending agency and a relief and development arm or agency. And, uh, and so these things find their way into a bigger picture. And, and so in terms of what it means to actually stand with those who are already called and sent out and serving around the world, we have many EMC people. In fact, we currently have 104 who are serving from across our churches with different mission agencies uh, and our own world partners who are serving around the world. And, um, and so the bottom of page six, we talk about being a doorway to mission agencies. And this gets a little bit into this collaboration question. One of the gifts in this season has been to meet with, uh, with leaders from larger churches in Canada. And by the way, I'll be advocating for our larger churches to be included in that conversation with, under the umbrella of the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada to have the churches there with the agencies and denominational mission arms uh, who are working together in more increased collaboration. This is already happening in our day, and it's good news for the kingdom because it means that we don't have to duplicate services. And just like Colin said over here, you know, curious about some of this on-ramp experience and preparation and alongside support, if, if our people are actually going out, let's say there's somebody from Three Hills who is going out and there's a strong mission partner uh, out of our Zion Didsbury church. And the awareness of what God is doing through all of our churches allows us to build the network so that they can be deployed through you. Then we do have to sort out what is your role, what is Three Hills' role, what is our role. And so by using templates and guidance to, to give framework to that, whether it's with uh, your partner or a mission agency like SIM or Wycliffe or whatever, that there's lots of collaboration happening now within the mission world in Canada. And this is fantastic um, because we need one another. And so there's a sense of praying together and exploring what's called future fitness for mission engagement. And by God's favor, we're part of these conversations. So we're thankful for that. And, uh, and we know that it's going to take time to build even the, the understanding and awareness of what our churches are involved in. But this sense of being a doorway is not to say, okay, God's called you. Well, here's, here's six places on the planet that we have uh, opportunities for you. But to pay attention to how God is the one who nudges us to participate. The body of Christ is actually called to affirm people in that sense of call. You have a role to stand with your people and the agency facilitates. And so there is that facilitation of that, that that isn't limited just to where we have existing partners or workers, or you do, but to open that up so that if it is in a remote place where we don't actually have uh, people there, that we leverage the wider network of the body of Christ and find a like-minded partner so that we have some options on the table. And so that's the approach of networking um, that we're seeing with the doorway to mission agencies. I commented earlier on this sense of one directory and having World Partners missionaries who have carried our banner under their name, do you know that that's not actually how it's written in our articles of governance for the EMCC? It isn't that we have a class of missionary workers who are supervised by us who are our own and they're called World Partners. But that developed into that, and there were reasons for that. So World Partners is a way to tie in all of this thought, and that global workers, uh, including those who are credentialed to be supervised by us or credentialed to be working with other mission agencies, can have equal status and standing. And there are others who are recognized in different ways. And that's what's provided in our governance. I can explain more on that later if that's all confusing. The idea is to have one directory where we publish this sense of unified directory um, for, uh, for workers and partners around the world that doesn't distinguish or discriminate or create a two-tiered system. And that uh, allows us to, again, foster this sense of unity across the body of Christ. Now, what about the top of that page, global professionals? There are those that still need extra levels of scrutiny. 
and we endeavor, like other denominations have done, is to develop a category of workers that you may already have in some of your churches, where you, you list them differently. And by calling people global professionals who are going out from our churches, they might be unfunded. They might be these retirees who are going uh, uh, to serve in Southeast Asia. But they might also be uh, farmers or engineers or medical personnel who are, or hospital workers of, of any kind, lab techs, who are going over and using their job as the, the, the way in the country and then to live their life uh, for Jesus there and join him in his mission. And by understanding that, that it is good for us to resource them and that that isn't just uh, sending over expatriates from Canada. Do you know how many people are registered right now with the Canadian government working overseas? Three million. So if 11% of those are deep committed followers of Jesus who are there on his mission, don't we want to resource those people and bless them and encourage them and be praying for them? And churches get ready because right now all we do is say, we can't give you any detail on this person working in a creative access country. But under a global professional banner, we'll be able to talk about the difference they're making and the lives that they're connecting with. And we will have to educate our churches to remember to pray for the whole work of God through their lives to be evident. But you might not get that in the stories. So be prepared for a different kind of, of narrative, a different kind of story, without robbing the heart of people living the good news of the kingdom and sharing Jesus with others. Global professionals. The last box we want to talk about is the top of page six, where we talk about global workers and global partners. And you've heard, you've heard us mention that before, global workers, global partners, what's the difference? We talk a little bit about in our terms document about that, so just as a point of reference. But to simply say that when we think of strategic global presence, we're thinking of deploying Canadian workers where it is of the most strategic sense. And that that strategic sense is in collaboration with those that we've had historical connection with and discernment to places where we, not ha we have not had a presence before. And so there's reference in that, in that box to a World Partners International group. And that is 25 sister denominations around the world that we are a part of, that we had the chance to be together with in September in Thailand. Kervin and Joel and myself were there. And it was a chance for those that were represented, 15 countries represented, to share what God is doing in their body of believers and to also pray for each other in the challenges. And so we had the chance to hear from Pastor Rodolfo Rodriguez, who leads the missionary church in Cuba. And he began his report by saying, thank you. Thank you for your 20 years of prayerful and financial and personal investment in us to become the church that we are today, where there are followers of Jesus that are able to meet, and there are government informants who aren't telling on us because we're living the way of Jesus, and that God is coming through, that there are churches that are multiplying. And he said, thank you for that. Thank you for your investment. And then he said, but now it is time for us to pay our debt. He said, we may not be rich in financial resources, but our people are everywhere. Our Cuban doctors and lawyers and nurses and professionals are in any manner of countries. They're in the Middle East, talking about global professionals, those that have access to these countries that we could not enter in under missionary or volunteer credentials. And so out of that vision that he has to say, our people are everywhere. We have been a church for 20 years that has received and now it is time for us to mobilize. What does it look like for us to partner with him in that posture? And what, what does it take for us to, to, out of cultural awareness and sensitivity, also hear what he's diplomatically asking, which is to say, can you partner with us in the way we need to be partnered with, not the way you would like to give to us? And that's a frank conversation. But how do we, out of a spirit of mutuality, meet with our brothers and sisters who are part of World Partners International or those that we have other connection with, out of that sense, and discern together what it means to have a strategic global presence together. And what might it mean for us to partner with Pastor Rodolfo and allow him to go to the Middle East to encourage those that he's connected with in their journey with Jesus and where they're serving? 
How is that our strategic influence? Now, I know you've enjoyed uh, uh, getting to know Nicole, if this is your first time to meet Nicole Jones-Conda. Um, it was uh, after her service with us, uh, working alongside Dan and Carrie Weens in South Africa, working on a conservation agriculture project in, under Farming God's Way, uh, helping to disciple people and to see them just get uh, uh, increased food yield uh, as God's provision came through. And so when she came back to Canada, there was this uh, urgency to, to connect with Nicole and see if she would continue to serve on our team. And she started with social media and, and prayer resourcing. And then last March, she came on board, uh, or April, um, and uh, her husband, Phil, is here tonight. They're coming up on their one-year anniversary in April. And, uh, and you can congratulate him later, and maybe Nicole as well. But, um, and, uh, and so the gift of that is that, um, is that she has already begun to work with individuals and churches to help uh, and, uh, walk alongside and say, what does your global mission engagement look like? And so I've really appreciated uh, the opportunity to uh, have Nicole as a partner in crime and giving leadership to World Partners this last year. Uh, and because integral development is, is a part of her story, uh, she's just going to walk us through this next chapter in, on page eight, um, integral development. We wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about integral development specifically. Um, because we've been using integral tonight a lot. We've been talking about integral mission, now we're moving into integral development. So again, feel free as you're digesting these documents as you leave tonight to refer to some of the terms to sort of hear what the heck we're talking about. But the reason we wanted to focus on integral development was because as a practice and as a, an approach, it partners with God's heart for restoration. And we want to explore that in a little bit more depth tonight. In our proposed mission and vision statements, we talk about personal and social vitality development and renewal. And for those of you that have been familiar with the way of Jesus language in the past, it's to say that in our individual lives, God cares deeply about how we depend on his spirit in our journey, how he cares how we are like him in our attitudes, behaviors, and character. I pray that one a lot. What does it mean to, to help someone and be helped in your journey with Jesus? That these are all individual actions and they're all about how we live our everyday lives. In our workplaces, within our families, in the civic engagement, where we are in community with one another. And just as God cares about and is guiding us in the one, how we live our one life, and how we live out that transformation is evident to people around us, he also cares about whole societies and whole cultures and whole people groups experiencing that same type of renewal and transformation. And so integral development is a piece of that. It talks about what it might mean to partner with people groups or communities to see that development, transformation, and renewal. And so we're gonna walk through a really sort of simple definition. Um, integral development, while it wasn't developed within the church, there's a ton of academia and practitioners around the world that talk about what it is at its core. And so simply defined, integral development is when a community, however you define a community, mobilizes their resources to meet their own needs as defined by them. And we'll have a chance to walk through that a little bit. But to say that bringing a community to mobilize their own resources is first to address a mindset, something that's simply said but not simply done. Moving from a mindset of scarcity of I don't have enough, I am not enough, I've never had enough, to resource possessing, and finally to development. And that mindset is not an us versus them thing. I have to pray that prayer all the time. I have to move from a mindset of scarcity to understand that I can trust in the source of all sufficiency. And so how then can I live my life? And same with communities in the context of integral development, that moving from that mindset of scarcity of lack of resource to resource possessing takes time. And that like the parable of the talents, it's not about whether you have one coin or you have 12 coins, it's that you have coins and you're meant to steward them and use them. And so in this process of moving a community along from a, a mindset of scarcity to resource possessing, there's language around these seven resources common to all. 
that in development literature and development practitioners, they talk about in every community, whether they've been in the same place for four generations or they are displaced, which is the, the truth of many communities around the world, that there is some degree of these seven category of resources within every community, that they're common to all. The first being the natural. What is in the environment? What is in God's creation? How has he, he prepared that? We talked about that in Farming God's Way a lot, that God provided soil no matter what condition it's in for our stewardship and our care. And what does it mean to steward a natural resource? Not exploit it, but steward it and use it. The second category being physical, those things that you can make from the natural, things like infrastructure. The third being human resources. What does each individual have and bring to the table that can be used? Whether that's their life experience or a skill set that they might have or their connection to other people, that every human has value, has worth, has some degree of resource that they can contribute. The next is social, that there are unique social networks, particularly in communities that have a sense of communal identity, that there are these invisible networks that connect one another. That when we think about our diaspora churches, as Joel has mentioned, that they have a unique network for those that they are connected to in their home country and also those other people that have lived around the world, that there's unique networks. That allows the Ethiopian church that we have in Calgary, Cornerstone or Moro, to sponsor 15 refugee families. That's use of social network and social resource. And so in all communities, there is a degree of that and how, do, how does one use that to see their own development. The next is spiritual, that where there are followers of Jesus, where there is a church, those disciple makers, those pastors, those deacons, those elders, those mentors, however you, however you define them, are a resource to the community. And that in fact, where there are not followers of Jesus, there is still spiritual resource seen in the community. That those healers and those mentors and those elders with that sage wisdom, that that is a source of resource for a community to use. Next being economic, trading resources in kind for one another or access to market. And the last is time, how to steward time. And in all of the academia and practitioners notes, time is noted as the most precious resource. How do we use it and how do we steward it well? And how can communities learn to see time as a resource? And so out of that conversation, that facilitation, that walking alongside, as communities discover that they have a degree of resource and they mobilize that resource again and again, and they in fact create new resources in these categories, that that can move from a place of scarcity to them being able to mobilize to meet their own needs and then further for their own development. And that it's really, really important to consider the fact that they are the ones, these, these communities are defining their own needs. We are not doing that. We are mere, merely facilitators because every community has its own unique gifts and challenges. And in that sense, integral development then isn't a tool in itself, but it's rather an approach. Which is why we've integrated it into our vision and strategic direction. That as we talk about working with global partners, that we come as facilitators of this process for them to discover the God-given resource that is among them, which Pastor Rodolfo talked about in spades. So how, how do we in our posture come with this idea of integral development in mind and be willing to walk the long road? Because mindset change is not something that happens overnight. Anyone who's tried to start a new habit knows that, <laughs> that it's hard fought and hard won. And so what does it mean for us as world partners to walk in this philosophy of integral development to the unique opportunities that God is placing before us and honoring the relationships we have with our global partners and with our churches and with individuals out of this facilitation piece in mind so that people can come to know Jesus as a friend
thinking about it in um, international terms, but that it in fact applies to every community, to how you approach local mission. And so even when we talk about church engagement and resourcing, key to resource in that vein, in talking about integral development for what it means for the community of Pittsburgh. What does it mean for those churches that are there? What does it mean for Red Deer? What does it mean for Calgary? Having relief and development together, and a lot of denominations have gone through similar kinds of processes of, of addressing how do we, how do we observe uh, and listen to um, to God's nudging and to our partners around the world who are hungry for a different conversation. How many times we've entered another culture and they say, what would you like to do in our country? We trained people to do that. And does that reflect the heart of God? Does that teach people to depend upon God as the all-sufficient source and to look directly to Him? And what we've been finding is that people are hungry for a discipling conversation that actually roots development in discipling. And that's why this is long and hard and slow and ongoing, but it's beautiful. And so it's not gonna have the bang for the buck that some of, some of our North American action-oriented immediate gratification mindset longs for. I'm gonna tell you that right up front. It's gonna feel like, oh, we're not doing enough. We're not doing anything. Patience, perseverance, honoring, getting in step with the Lord. So by, by, con, by understanding that we also continue to have urgent situations that require and move us to action. And this is the final page, page nine, compassionate action. That all around the world there are people who have been made vulnerable and who continue to face injustice, poverty, disaster. And it is the love and compassion of Jesus that moved him to look at the crowds and respond to their needs. And so it is with us as God's people that we continue to respond in humanitarian need around the world. And we're excited to say that we're doing that collaboratively with other uh, Christian and like-minded agencies for disasters and those who are displaced and so on. And, in this last couple of years, we've been able to respond together through our partners at the Canadian Food Grains Bank uh, to the Rohingya refugees and to people in South Sudan uh, who have faced severe drought, to people in Yemen where not many Christian organizations have access into Yemen, but through our CFGB partner network, we've been able to bring uh, emergency humanitarian relief in the name of Jesus to people, to 1,100 people in Yemen. And so the gift of, of walking together in humanitarian response is there. Many of our churches have been leading the way and so talking about this final box, restoring justice, that many of our churches are hungering for a, des a desire to respond to this exploitation of human beings in particular. And so we've put it here to say, Lord, make us a people who pray and may we be those who are helping to resource our churches to pray for and respond to injustices committed against human beings. And that means uh, opening the doorway for us to work with local and global organizations who are dealing with injustice. And many of your churches are already doing that. And so it's bringing that together and knitting it in compassionate action. Now I'm going to invite Pam Hicks up. Pam is... Uh, I like to, to say she's my boss because she's my executive assistant and keeps me, uh, keeps everything organized in my world and I'm grateful for her partnership there. But she loves the Lord and loves the nations of the world and, and particularly one of the gifts and strengths she brings is in this area of refugee sponsorship. So I'd like you to welcome her uh, to the front here as she talks about that. So sponsoring a refugee family is a great opportunity to continue to share the love of God with all the nations. In 2015, there was much in the news about the Syrian refugees, and the government made an appeal for sponsors to help bring families to Canada. The fervor over the next three years was incredible as many responded. Some of you, our own EMCC churches, responded and were so grateful. Despite the lack of news coverage today, the situation is still critical for many. There are also families that have been torn apart by violence and ethnic cleansing in the Congo and Ethiopia. You've seen the ongoing situation in Yemen. 
I received many emails from followers of Jesus from Pakistan who have fled to Thailand due to incredible persecution. They now live in fear of deportation or detention because Thailand doesn't recognize asylum refugees. As EMCC, we truly believe Jesus calls us to compassionately respond to people made vulnerable by circumstances. As a church body, we encourage you to wrestle with this. Sponsors are providing more than just a safe haven for these families. They are offering friendship, support, and a future. And through these relationships, there is the opportunity to be the tangible love of Jesus, that these refugees would know that God has not abandoned them, even if they don't know him. Last month, the government responded to the UNHCR's request to bring to Canada more than 600 people in Libya. Most of these people have fled their home country due to adversity and headed to Libya in the hope of a better life. Instead, they found themselves being exploited or sold into slavery. In bringing these refugees to Canada, the government is relying on churches and communities to help resettle these newcomers. Hillside Church in Coquitlam, BC responded to the Syrian refugee crisis a couple years ago, and we're gonna show a video of Pastor Derwin sharing their experience. We uh, agreed a, a couple of years ago to sponsor a, a Syrian refugee family. Um, and then it's a waiting game. And through an interesting connection with our, our city's mayor, Mayor Coquitlam, and uh, a city councillor, they kind of opened the door for us to, to consider um, helping them refurbish a couple of townhomes that had been run down. About 40 of our members um, took various days and, and went in and basically uh, refurbished these houses. Uh, families from Syria are now living in these beautiful, beautiful homes that have been re refurbished by our congregation. We have a house, our church owns a house on our property, the one you can see behind me here. It had been served as a, a rental house. Four months ago, our, our congregation heard news that our family had, they were coming, and suddenly this place was vacant. God's timing was perfect. Basically over a few Saturdays, our, our congregation uh, gutted this place and put in new flooring and painted the entire place and, and uh, got it just looking top notch. And uh, our family has moved in and, and they're living there and it's just been a, an amazing journey for us. Family's doing really well. Uh, the the uh, one son is in school and, and the others, the, the mother and the father uh, and their young, youngest daughter uh, have been accepted in an English program uh, and are learning English. And uh, they, they actually are attending our church. They're there every Sunday. They're, they're becoming part of the family. It's easy to love the ideas of, of, of refugees in general and, and see, seeing them as a people of, of great need. Uh, this has become personal for us. These are real families who we've gotten to meet and gotten to know um, with, with their children. And uh, it's been something where it feels like God's been pushing the compassion button of our congregation. We've in the past done a lot of things overseas, um, but this is now in our neighborhood. Hood, neighborhood. <laughs> So we're setting you loose into your table groups again for 10 more minutes to discuss these last three boxes, strategic global presence, integral development, and compassionate action, and we'll call you back together.
Okay, we're going to encourage the winding down of table conversations. And I'm going to roam with the mic. Just kidding, Joel's going to talk. Uh, this just in over the live stream, just uh, thought you might appreciate the depth of this question. So at the beginning, we, missed, we mentioned the move to urban centers as one of the global trends. What are churches doing well in those centers to embrace that change, and how do we as a denomination need to adapt and change and unlearn? Thought you'd like to uh, let that rest with you as well. Um, and, uh, and so from a denominational perspective, do we need to pray more about movement into our urban centers in Canada uh, as well? And so one of the, the movements in Canada is called Move In, um, that has been gaining some momentum, but there are many more movements as well. Okay, I'm heading to this side of the room. So if you can give one key insight and then we're gonna move along here. Hey, honey. <laughs> uh, so my name is Phil. <laughs> um, Happy anniversary. Thanks. Um, so, I, I guess it's something that I'm, I'm kind of passionate about too a little bit, but uh, so I, I kind of went on a bit of a rant, so I'll try and summarize. Um, but just on the, the point of integral development and even our own participation in that and how that looks and realizing that we do have to unlearn, we do have to re-educate ourselves and realizing that it's not us that has the answers, it really is God's mission. And again, that's, that's, a, that's a paradigm shift for us. Um, and how do we do that? And I think that's, I think, a question that we individually need to be asking as a church, as a denomination. That's something that we should really have at the top of our minds. Um, and again, separating that idea of uh, relief and development and realizing that just helping people and throwing money at it is not. There's, there's all sorts of research about how that doesn't work and actually can have a negative effect and as, we, as we're seeing that now. Um, so again, yeah, just I think the big question is really how how do we learn? Um, yeah, I think that's just a, a better posture. Cutting you off, but thank you. Okay, <laughs> next table. Hi, I'm Brian. Uh, our one, well, we had many points, but our one point that uh, it was on compassion, how to live out, how to live this out at home. 
uh, with Jesus teaching, take care of the widows and orphans, uh, how do we do that with the people next door? Okay, I'm Colin. Um, so we're wrestling, we, what we applaud real quick is the, the wrestling with the world and its present realities uh, using some, some uh, it sounds like new language in all of this. And so then, of course, we're begging the question of the role of world partners in this. Uh, do you sit down as a resource with us individually? One of the dynamics of, you're talking about refugee work, one of the dynamics is we have quite a few of us are from small communities here and we're talking about moving into the city and all of that. So I guess Didsbury's moving now. We're all going to the city. Um, but what role do we play in that then? How can we walk alongside a refugee family? And we appreciate the partnerships that we ha have like with Crossroads and ones like that. Um, I think the thing that really came to mind was we haven't talked really about care, missionary care, and I really like the seven resources. I think that would apply to missionary care on, on those seven realms. And also we just talked about how really it was about relationship. It really boils down to everything's about how do we create relationship within, in the organizations, with the missionaries sending. It's very important. Hesitant table. Yeah, I guess there was lots we talked about. My name's Kelly. There's lots we talked about. One of the questions I think we had was um, with this idea of continuing to collaborate and partner and uh, the, the one directory where some would be with world partners, some connected to other, uh, more, more directly connected to other agencies and just affiliated. So just kind of what, what keeps world partners unique? What, what would be world partners place? in all of that? That's a question. Hello, I'm James. Uh, we talked about a couple of things. One was World Park Internationals, what does that mean? And the other, the old term we used to use is missionary alone. Then farming Jesus way. Uh, we're going to Ukraine this year, and we're just talking about in Ukraine, how um, since the, this country is divided in half, that there doesn't seem to be any hope of future. And I was thinking of you and you were talking earlier about how do you get there and how do you convince those people that that land is still fertile? You've got to mobilize them, encourage them that there's a future there. And just how do you do it? It just seems like a big overwhelming, but with the Lord's help, it can happen. Happy to have a conversation after about that. Thank you. My name is Lucas. We heartily applaud the great change in posture that, that we're hearing tonight. Concerning the seven resources, we're concerned that if there, if there are seven equal resources that the spiritual may fade away and be lost, we're concerned that there be a strongly held spiritual focus. Otherwise, it will be consumed by the great human needs. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tracy. Um, we spent a lot of time in the strategic global presence, and I think one of the concerns that was raised is just the concept that um, as much as we affirm very much the broad sweep, you know, it's a very much a yes-yes strategy. From what we see here, it's, it's anybody is included and wherever you want to go is good. And there's a beauty in that, but there's also a danger in that we're so broadly, you know, we're not able to do anything great. And there's the, the actual strategy for me when I look at this is missing in terms of, and I'll just give an example, we spoke earlier, um, in terms of um, least reached people groups. So that would be one particular strategy that you go, okay, so if all of us are just going where we think God is calling us, um, and we have all these places around the world where they're already equipped, they're already established, the churches, the missions, like we've been there for 100 years, why aren't we going to other places? And if, if the young people in our churches and everybody else, if we're not giving some form of direction, then I think we, we danger ourselves in getting so broad and not actually landing somewhere. And it, it feels good because we're partnering with our other churches, you know, in other places like India, which is great and it's not wrong, but there are parts of India that are still unreached versus going to the places where we have these huge movements and these huge churches, which I love. <laughs> but I wonder, like, can, should we be more narrow? Um, that's one of the things we covered. So. Uh, 
and I'm Brian. Uh, one of the things that came, came up, I think, is uh, a little bit about strategy. So if, if we're all doing different things that are really good, but uh, we all don't know what each other's doing, sometimes there's this commonality that we can do more together. And so how do we find that out? How, what's the communication lines and the strategies to be able to find that out where there's, there's you know, a, a church or a group that are really doing a fantastic job at some place, but they really need maybe some other groups to come alongside. How do we get that together and work together? Thank you for all of this processing and feedback. And just to kind of harken back to what Joel said at the beginning of our night, that these are living documents, these are skeletons. And so your input into the big rocks in the jar, so to speak, the big ideas, are incredibly helpful for us. And we appreciate your yearning for continued clarity and refinement on those pieces that you're passionate about and those resources that are most specific to you and would be most helpful. We um, are grateful for just stretching the clock a little bit tonight. Uh, we want to um, invite Mark Anderson to come up. In asking Mark to join us on our, our tour um, to, to round out a prayer exercise for us that talks about posture, he's going to explain a little bit more about how he got involved in cultural intelligence and, uh, and lead us in a, a spiritual exercise. And then uh, we'll do a, a summation of... Uh, a place that that we're already feeling called to start uh, in terms of engagement with your churches, and uh, and then we don't have to leave. We're we're available to stick around for questions, and we'll explain a little bit more about other ways to get in touch with us. But would you welcome Mark Anderson here, please? It says, it's fun to see how uh, how God works. Uh, to bring us all to kind of the same place, but using very different avenues, right? Um, and for myself, I, um, I'm passionate about young people, youth. Uh, that's, that's what gets uh, my head moving. And in that work, one of the things that I was struggling with was how do, uh, how do we reach cross-generationally? How do we work cross-generationally? And one of the things like, I came to realize, and as I was reading and studying, is that when we reach cross-generationally, we are actually doing cross-cultural work. Um, and I, so myself as a millennial, OK? And I'm sorry if that offends any of you in the crowd, but you'll get over it. Uh, myself as a millennial, how do I work with the older generation of the church? Uh, the older generation of the church, the, the boomers and uh, the builders, how are you guys relating to me? And that was a question that I was struggling with. And I, I, as I was trying to unpack that and wrestle with it, I found that the best way to approach this is a cultural co conversation because we have a passion and a desire, particularly in our denomination, to work cross-culturally. And that's a beautiful thing. Uh, that's a beautiful history and peace that we have. And it, so for me, in this desire to understand it, I went off and I got this, this training in, cross, uh, in cultural intelligence, it's called. And it was something that was actually birthed out of a church, out of, um, out of youth ministry. Uh, from there, they realized this has massive implications. And it is now a worldwide uh, thing that exists. Um, and it's, there's an assessment part of it. And if you're interested in that, I'm happy to talk with you after about that. Um, but cu cultural intelligence is basically, it's a way of looking at and measuring how do we engage uh, and relate and work cross-culturally well. How do we do it well? And this is, this is a question of integral mission. How do, we, uh, how do we love, how do we proclaim and actually show our love to our neighbor well? And when I say well, I mean in a way that they understand, a way that they actually feel loved, honored, respected, cared for, okay? Um, and this is difficult. So if you think about your own neighbor, sometimes this can be difficult if you share a culture, right? And this becomes extremely more difficult as we have a totally different cultural basis. 
there's more work to be done. More work in loving our neighbor well when we're working cross-culturally. And as Canadian culture shifts, as we, as we work through globalization, right? As we have these uh, generational cultural gaps, like we have millennials, Gen Zs, alphas are going into kindergarten now. Uh, that, that's an, <laughs> ah, right? And people are like, I didn't even know there was something after millennials. <laughs> no, no. It's just like millennials are old, okay? I'm no longer a young person standing up here. I am an old person, okay? So, uh, this is something we all need to wrestle with. This isn't something we can, we can just offshore. Traditionally, mission, as Canadians, when we were largely a Christian culture, when we looked at mission, we had to go out. That is not the case anymore. Going out is a beautiful thing, and we want to applaud that and accept it, but the reality is, is we are all on mission. We got, uh, someone said to us on, on this tour that it sounds like you're taking the bar of missionary and you're lowering it. And we said, no. We are raising everybody up. This is no longer the missionaries we are sending. We are all acting as sent. Okay? And when we talk about cultural intelligence and interacting well, awareness, this isn't about like political correctness, um, but it's, it's being aware and intentionally learning about how to love and respect people. Okay? And what I'm, I want to do as we close is I want to lead us through a prayer exercise. And what I'm hoping is that this will give us some time to pause at the end of an evening. Pause to reflect, to monitor our posture. How, how we interact, how we, how we think, how we start out has such a huge impact on where we land. And so we want to just take some time in Scripture, allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us, and remind us of some beautiful truths. So when I, was, when I went to go do cultural intelligence training, one of the first things, David Livermore, he's one of the teachers and uh, founders of th that whole way of thinking, he said, there's a room of about 35 people, he says, I want you to think of the cultural group you struggle with the most. He asked us to think, what do they sound like? What do they smell like? How do they talk? And then he said, I'd like you to turn to your neighbor and tell them who that is. And I, I'll tell you, I, I almost fell off my chair, okay? As a, as a uh, relatively sheltered white millennial Canadian, I was like, I don't have cultural bias. It took me like five minutes to process through the fact that I have people groups that I struggle with. And I'm not going to do that to you this evening. I'm not going to make you turn to your neighbor and divulge that deep, dark secret. Um, we can save that. Like, it was different because we didn't know anybody else in the room, right? It's much easier to share with strangers than it is to share with people we have to go to church with. All right? It's a little sick, but anyways. Um, but I do, want you, I do want you to think of the cultural group that you struggle with the most. Okay? I want you to form them in your mind. And this could be, it could be an ethnic group. Okay? This could be, uh, it could be an age group. Like, maybe since the time I told you I was a millennial, your mind has been melting. Right? Maybe that's it. Maybe the fact that I mentioned Gen Alpha is just like, I don't know what they are, but I'm definitely freaking out about them. Could be an age group culture. It could be socioeconomic. The extreme rich, the extreme poor. There's a cultural shared there that has to be worked through. That's something that God has been working in my life, is to work with people who don't have and understand what that means and to, to live not as they're not scarcity. They're not in scarcity, changing my posture in, in them. Anyways, socioeconomic. Or maybe it's a very, very specific subcultural group that you're just like, when you say culture, that's what I think of. It's them, that's who I struggle with. And so I want you to think of the one person within that group that's for you. And if it helps, give them a face, give them a name. If it's a real person, okay. If it's imaginary, that's all right too. 
God gave us imagination, we might as well use it. Okay? And if you're sitting there and you're thinking, I struggle with white millennial males, I'm here for you. You can just look at me, you don't need to picture somebody in your brain. All right? And what we're going to do is I want you to take that person and I want you to put them on the back of your mind for a moment. Because we're going to add a few people to this group. Because next I'd like you to think of your neighbor. Your actual neighbor. All right? Someone who maybe lives across the hall, maybe just down the hall, in the next house, on the next road over if you live out in the sticks. But your actual neighbor. And I hope, I hope that you can all say that you know their name. If you don't, food for thought. Go learn your neighbor's name. Um, but picture them. Just one if you have a few, but just pick one. Picture them and take them and put them beside the representative of the cultural group that you're struggling with. Third, I want you to take someone within your own faith family. All right? So someone who identifies as a follower of Jesus. And maybe they go to the same Sunday morning service as you. And when you see them, your blood kind of tingles a bit. doesn't boil because we're good, right? Maybe they go to that weird church across town, but you guys have like social interactions that, and it freaks you out. But someone who, who identifies as a follower of Jesus that you struggle with. So take them. And then thirdly, I, or fourthly, I put... Um, photos on your table. So there's a pile of, they're white down, they're, they're white, they're face down. Those on online uh, who are streaming this, just picture somebody else random. But the photo is there, so if you just all wanna grab one, grab one, pass it around. It doesn't matter who you get. Um, this is a representation of the unknown, of the stranger that we haven't quite thought of okay and this might be it might be a duplicate of the cultural group you struggle with it might look disturbingly like your neighbor um, but this is kind of that unknown person because God has a has a desire to constantly be introducing new people to us right And I w what I want you to do now is I want you to take your imaginary small group, okay? And this is your, your cultural group that you struggle with, your neighbor, actual neighbor, the fellow follower of Christ that you struggle with, and the photo, the stranger that you have. And what I'd like you to do is we're going to give you just a minute to pray through the Lord's Prayer together. And when I say that, I, I want to be very specific. I want you to pray it with them. Not for them, not over them, but with them in a way where you own each petition equally. And as you're praying, attach the first two words to each part. What does it mean to pray our Father? Or even, you can even just go shorter, the R. Where is the sense that God created all of these people? Loves them, desires to be in relationship with them, even though I find them difficult and strange. That was a good exclamation. So we're going to give you just one minute to do that, and we're, it's gonna be that nice, awkward silence in the room, okay? And then we're gonna come back and we're just gonna pray through the Lord's Prayer all together here. And if this, is, um, if this version up here is something that you're just like, that's not the version I know, don't worry about it, just pray the one that you know in your head, that's fine. But when we come back and pray together, we'll pray the one that's on the screen. Um, and we'll trust that the Holy Spirit is gonna speak to us. The Holy Spirit is going to teach us something in this moment. So we'll just give you one minute.
Let's pray together as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. We trust and hope that the Holy Spirit spoke to you. And if it didn't, I invite you to trust and hope that it spoke to others. And uh, if we had more time, I'd love for us to share, but we want to respect the clock as much as we can this evening. But if something did stir in you, talk about it. Bring it to the, your, uh, your, on your car ride home. Bring it up. Don't let it just sit there. Use this as a time of, uh, of confession, of processing, and as deepening your relationship around what God has for us. Uh, and I'm going to invite uh, Joel and Nicole up just to close us. But if, uh, if cultural intelligence is, is something tweaked there for you and you would like to know more, just come and talk to me afterward or you can shoot me an email. Okay. Thank you, Mark. And Mark would like those photos back. If you felt particular attachment to any of those, you can negotiate that with Mark this evening. Um, thanks for, for leading us in an exercise of, of posture as well. We're wrapping up this evening. Um, and of course, if you want to talk further about uh, engagement with your church or with people that you are working with who are responding to God's nudging, then by all means, make the connection with Nicole. And our cards are on the back there uh, near the cinnamon buns, which is a great place for business cards. Um, and if you want more information on refugee sponsorship options and opportunities, you can talk to Pam on cultural intelligence, as Mark has mentioned. But in summary, we want to help serve the church. God is inviting us into a season and a posture of humble engagement. And there's an opportunity for us to keep growing and learning. The theology of integral mission is a starting point for you to just take that and reflect on it and what we've been talking about here. But there are other ways in which there are other pieces, um, as, as Nicole has mentioned, Kairos course and other kinds of resources, prayer resources that are available. And uh, we want to help you on your learning journey. And so those of you who are, are staff people on churches or involved in mission committees, uh, there's good opportunity here for you to grow. And you might have questions about resources that you have access to, some of that vetting, some additional wisdom. Simply to say, too, that participation in God's mission might start with that very active step of learning. Tracy talking about least reached people groups, that being the new frontier. Maybe that is part of the learning process for you. Maybe it's increased learning about integral development and what the Bible has to say about that. And that we are keen to help you in that journey and resource you in whatever way God is nudging you and whatever way is most helpful. And if that learning is on an individual basis, making it available to those within your churches or you as an individual in your discipleship journey, or thinking about talking about God's heart for the world within our kids' programs and within our prayer groups and our Bible studies, what does that look like? And we'd be happy to talk with you about that. Secondly, just to, you, you've already raised this as questions of how this is going to work, but we long not only to connect to the heart of God, who has a mission and invites us to participate into a, a posture, a philosophy of development, but to continue to connect with one another. And Brian Archer, if I had all the answers of how we're going to sort this all out, I think we're going to be blown away as we begin to build a database just of awareness of what our churches are doing and how that will help us. And so there's some of this that will come through systems. Uh, and it's going to take some time to become aware of that as it continues to grow and develop. But we also want to connect you to partners and to causes and to other mission agencies and to one another as we follow Jesus together. 
And, uh, and so that's a, a way that we'd love to begin to serve. And finally, this area of mobilization. What does it mean for all of us to participate with God in what he's doing around the world? That it's not just for the professional few, although we honor and support those who feel that full-time vocational call and continue to support those that are with us at World Partners. But to be able to say that every person who has an encounter with Jesus and a journey with Jesus has something to offer, has gifts that are being stirred in them. And so what does it mean to mobilize those gifts for God's mission? And our heart is that every person feels like they can be included in that. And how do we set up our resourcing and our conversations and resource those of you that are mobilizing and discipling within your context to help everyone understand that they have a part to play and that that is an invitation and it's an invitation from God from his missional heart. Thanks for giving a little extra time tonight and for your participation. Um, the, the cards we'd love to collect, um, and so you can leave those on the table along with the photos. The documents we'd love for you to take with you and, uh, and that you would be able to reflect on them, to think more deeply. Um, we're looking for any further input. We've been receiving a lot of input by email and follow-up phone calls and, and so on. Um, and, and so we'd like to receive that from you by March 29th. You get the shortest deadline as the last tour stop. But we're working very aggressively now to begin to put together, uh, you know, put some flesh on the bones and present that vision uh, to our assembly by the end of April. And so we're grateful that you've come tonight to participate. It may be a little different than you expected, um, but we're grateful that it's stimulating the things that God wants us to be thinking about as we move forward as a a family of churches, and that it will help you in your journey with Jesus. And, um, and so with that, I'm, I'm going to just put David Benjamin on the spot and invite him to come and close our, our time uh, in prayer. Um, and then, again, we don't have to rush away. There's a bit more snack, so if you need to leave, God bless you and thank you. But I, I would love if we could also just express a round of applause for Crossroads Church for hosting us tonight. Stand with me, pray together. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have called us uh, to be your friend. And Lord, as we look uh, at people across the street around the world and ask the question, who is our neighbor? And who needs to now be invited to become a friend of God? Father, we pray that you will continue to encourage uh, mobilize us and Father as leaders that are representing uh, many in our churches and in our area of influence Father may our hearts be always in tune with yours with your mission so that we can continue to make that the purpose of the church and, and the places that we lead in as we go from here Father we pray that he will take us safely back home and continue to bless our brother Joel and his wonderful team and, and the leadership of uh, EMCC as we come together um, at the assembly and continue to seek uh, your face in what we should do, how we should pray, and how we should go today. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, and thanks again to all those who joined us on the live stream as well. So we're here to talk if you would like further follow-up. <laughs>